Thank you, Kurt. Hello. Okay. Um, when I was 18, I spent a summer with a wonderful Bernathan family in the Catskills. And the occasion arose for me to fold my laundry one day. The occasion arose for me to fold my laundry one day, and three of the young daughters who were in the household were watching me fold my laundry. And I noticed that they were looking, me, looking at me with these incredulous expressions, like, what are you doing? And I said, what are you looking at? What's the problem? They said, you don't know how to fold a shirt. <laughs> and I said, there's a way to fold a shirt? They said, of course. There's a way to fold a shirt. So they very kindly, kindly showed me how to fold a shirt. And I was so grateful for that. But today we're going to talk about a different kind of folding, protein folding, which is a lot more complicated than folding a shirt. A lot more complicated. Um, my apologies to Ruben for using the word paradigms in my <coughs> title. But it was there before I was made aware that that was probably not the best title to use. Proteins are subtle and delicate things. There's 80 million proteins in the world, probably more. And uh, in the human body, there's probably between 80 and 100,000 proteins that have multiple functions. Now here is basic globular protein. In each one of the little spheres that you see here is an atom. And they're joining together to form amino acids. And this particular schematic or model is probably an enzyme which has a specific function. And we have lots of different functions of proteins, uh, enzymes being among them. And enzymes are particularly interesting because they catalyze biochemical reactions a billion times faster than would occur naturally. In other words, the reaction time spontaneously would be unable to sustain life. So basically without enzymes to catalyze reactions, we wouldn't even have life because a billion fold is significant. Now, here's a chart I want you to memorize. <laughs> this is one of three. It's metabolic pathway charts put out by Roche Pharmaceuticals, and it shows um, some metabolic pathways. Almost every one of these labels is, in fact, an enzyme doing a specific function. As I said, there's three of these charts, and they only represent about 1% of the metabolic pathways in the human body. So they're making proteins, and they're dividing proteins, and what we're going to talk about today are the forces at work operating at the atomic level and the apparent causes or forces in nature corresponding to spiritual qualities. And we're also going to once again dwell on the idea that influx fine tunes by effects on the electrical charges. And why we re really look at protein folding, the next slide will explain this a little better. It's a quotation by Ian Thompson, slightly embellished by a suggestion from our other colleague who's not here today, uh, Gard Perry. Um, so here's Ian's quotation. I won't read it. You can read it. It's on the handout. It's, uh, it's profound, and it basically states our mission. Uh, as far as what we've been doing for the past year in regard to protein folding. We do think that a fuller understanding of the discrete, discrete degrees formed by divine influx can lead to major breakthroughs in science, not just in the complex and beautiful story of protein folding, but on all areas of science. So basically there's been three approaches to the study of protein. Um, in vivo, means within the living cell. Now, there's problems with looking inside the cell, as you can imagine. 
The cell is very tiny. It's very fragile. It's loaded with hundreds of different proteins, not just one, but hundreds of different kinds of proteins within the cell. And as Andy Heilman points out, it's also living. So it's hard to get inside a living cell without killing it. That's the problem. For the past 100 years, much of the research has been done in vitro, which means in glass, in vitro, or in a test tube. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Great strides have been made in the in vitro methods. And then finally, since the advent of um, high-powered computers and sophisticated software programs, a lot of progress has been made in what's called in silico, or computational research into protein synthesis. And sometimes when you read the research papers, it's hard to understand at first where they're coming from. Are they doing this in silico? Are they doing this in vitro? Read the papers pretty carefully to understand where they're coming from. Quantum physics began with the impetus from the electrical lighting industry in Germany in the late 1800s. And the study of protein synthesis began with the industrialization of brewing and baking because they really wanted to know what was behind alcohol. And it was Louis Pasteur who first pr proposed that it was, in fact, yeast, living cells. And he really never really gave up the idea of what's called vitalism or that living organisms were responsible driving this process forward. Um, he had a big controversy with a fellow named Liebig who said, no, it's not living cells. It's the remnants of yeast that are doing the fermentation. And then this fellow named Moritz Traube came along and said, actually, there's a chemical inside the yeast. And later we found out, indeed, there's enzymes working. And the enzymes were known to be proteins. Protein comes from the Greek word proteos, which means first. Uh, is it first or fourth in the organic molecules that comprise all life? And the organic molecules that comprise all of life in plants and animals are carbohydrates, lipids, uh, nucleic acids, and proteins. We jump ahead about a century from Pasteur to this fellow named Christian Anfinson. He won the Nobel Prize in 1972 in chemistry for demonstrating, and this is the simple version, that the sequence of the amino acids in the polypeptide chain determined the final active tertiary form. So all you had to do was know A, B, C, D, the alphabet of the amino acids strung on the chain. And that was entirely sufficient how it would fold into the final active tertiary form which is a dramatic discovery. And he did that through a specific experiment, which we'll discuss in a second. But first of all, what is it determines, what actually determines the amino acid sequence on the polypeptide chain? Well, it's the code in the DNA. That's really what DNA does. It just builds proteins. It just, it's the recipe book for protein synthesis. So the recipe is taken from the DNA by messenger RNA down to the ribosome. The ribosome is like a 10-star Michelin restaurant. Now, we know there's only three-star Michelins. There's no 10-star. But the ribosome is like a 10-star restaurant kitchen where this marvelous little chef called the transfer RNA is spitting out molecular cuisine. And the molecular cuisine are called polypeptide chains. And they exit from the uh, ribosome in the form of what's called a random coil. And then they're met frequently by chaperone proteins, which we'll discuss at the end of the talk. Now, Christian Anfinson took a specific enzy an enzyme protein called ribonuclease A, and denatured it. Every time you fry an egg or boil an egg, you're denaturing the protein. And what that means, you're changing it from the folded form into the unfolded linear form, the random coil, just a, 
just a chain. Um, and then once he denatured it with two very strong agents, one was called uh, eight mole urea, and then another was called beta mercaptoethanol. Uh, he had to use the beta mercaptoethanol because there are some very strong bonds inside called disulfide bonds <clears throat> that were hard to uh, break apart. So we used the even stronger chemical to do that. But once he denatured the protein, by putting that protein back in a physiologic solution at physiologic temperature, remarkably, it folded up again all by itself. Just there in a test tube. It changed from a random coil back to the useful folded tertiary form, which was enough of a uh, astonishing feat that he did win the Nobel Prize for this in 72 with his two other cohorts. Now, in the formation of protein, we have three different forms. We have the primary form, which is the polypeptide chain. When it's first born, it's also called a random coil, as I said. The secondary form is the alpha helix and the beta sheets, or the beta strands. Um, the alpha helix is just simply a coil. And it's just a, a spiral, a, just a spiral. And the beta sheet, I'll show you the next slide because I can sort of show you. If you take the uh, primary example on the far left and just squish it together, and all those amino acids are then linked by hydrogen bonds, you'll get a beta sheet or a beta strand. And then the other secondary strand is an alpha helix, but there's also beta sheets in there. Then you get the final tertiary form. Now the tertiary form can then <clears throat> join up with other tertiary forms to form a, a quaternary form. And an example would be hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has four strands together to form an active molecule, which we know carries oxygen in our blood. And how do I get this little thing to play? To click it, little video. Let me see. Hmm. Do you know how to do that? How to, how to get the video? Because I have another video I want to play that's even a little more important than this. The order of amino acids is only part of the story. Because of the different shapes of the individual amino acids, they like to fold into even more interesting three-dimensional shapes. This molecule is twisting into several different spiral or helical shapes, and then those are folding on each other. Okay. All right. There's a thank you, Susie, for putting that video in for me. <laughs> Appreciate that. The order of amino acids is only part of the story. Because of the different shapes of the individual... Go to the next one. There we go. Um, for discrete degrees, and this is basic to our protein folding scheme here, is that the goal is contained within the cause, and the cause and the end are contained within the effect. And we'll see this over and over in the way the proteins fold. This is, and you've seen this, I think, on one of Ruben's slides. We have the uh, alpha helices on the left in three different colors, and then we have these sort of strands, which are remnants of the uh, random coils. And then on the far right, those blue ribbons are the uh, beta sheets or the beta strands. And they all sort of roll up together to form the uh, folded protein, the active form, the tertiary form. Now we come to the one of the most interesting things in all of science. And it's called Leventhal's paradox. And it was mentioned by one of our, I don't know whether it was uh, I think maybe Andy earlier mentioned, or Ruben mentioned it earlier, Leventhal's Paradox. In 1969, Cyrus Leventhal, I think at the time working at uh, MIT, possibly Columbia, but I think it was MIT, realized that if you took a chain of only 100 amino acids, which is by no means large for a protein, proteins range average 500 amino acids, to a thousand. So a hundred amino acid chain is pretty small. And you made a trial fold or a hunt, let's call it a hunt. It tries to fold up 
once every 10 trillionth of a second. One trial hunt for the proper position every 10 trillionth of a second. It would take 10 to the 81 years to form a properly folded protein. The active form would be many, many, many times the age of the universe to fold correctly. So he's sort of scratching his head and says, there's something very strange here. How does this work? Because this is a small polypeptide chain and it's just not going to happen. It just can't happen. Well, it can, but it's going to take till the universe is probably no longer here. At any rate, well, it'll be here, but at any rate, there have been many attempts, many attempts to solve Leventhal's paradox. Every other paper you see, I've got the answer. Now I know this is Leventhal's paradox. Here's the answer to Leventhal's paradox. It's basically come down to the fact that there's some sort of bias in the pathways. Well, that's fine, but where does the bias come from? I mean, you know, if you're biased, you're conscious of it. But these, these don't have consciousness. They don't have knowledge in them. Or do they? Ian says they don't. So I believe Ian. They don't have a knowledge. But somehow they know how to fold because Levin, um, Anfinson proved that you can just take a polypeptide chain and put it in a physiologic solution and it knows how to fold. It'll fold properly. So they came, they've come up with this idea of a funnel. Now I'm sorry some of the this is their you'll see these funnels shown in many different forms in almost every paper that describes that tries to describe Leventhal's paradox. And at the very top, you see what's called configurational entropy. And then it's free energy coming down from top to bottom. So you all know what entropy is. It's your kid's messy bedroom. <laughs> That's entropy. It happens all by itself. It just, it just happens. Or my messy workshop. It's entropy. It just, it just happens. I don't work at it. It just, I walk in there and I, this is terrible. How did this happen? But it takes a lot of work to clean it up. And a year later, there it is once again all messed up. Just happens. So there's a lot of definitions for entropy, what they could be. Entropy is dispersion, disorder, chaos, but it really comes down to uncertainty. There's, there's, there's uncertainty in entropy. The problem I have with this scheme, this energy funnel, which almost all the scientists use to explain this, is that entropy presupposes uncertainty. And yet, is there really uncertainty in the chain? If there's uncertainty, then Leventhal's paradox can never be solved because it won't know how to fold, but somehow it knows how to fold. So another problem is from an energy standpoint, from the top of the funnel to the bottom, the energy is minus five kilocals per mole. And that's about equal to the energy of one hydrogen bond. But there's hundreds of hydrogen bonds, hundreds in a protein molecule. So we have difficulty with this from two aspects. And as two of the leading researchers, Mel Keek and Mayer, point out, both topological and physical constraints really don't allow this simple funnel to explain Leventhal's paradox. I will also say that if there is a Protein folding, power, uh, protein folding funnel, each individual protein of the 80 million proteins in the world has its own individual funnel, if that's really the way it works. Something like that might be the answer. So now we're finally trying to add theology to the, to the, um, to the problem and see if that helps. Um, key theological principle is the causes are spiritual. Thank you, Andy, for enlightening me with this. They only appear to be from nature. And all forms, thank you, Reuben, this is your contribution, all forms tend towards the human form. And let
let's see. We get this to play. Oh, into the picture? Oh, I see, the little arrow. There we go. Okay. things do tend towards the human. <laughs> Kinesin molecule. Yeah. Okay. So there's competing theories of protein folding. They all seem to uh, utilize what's called Gibbs free energy, which is an important uh, principle in chemistry that for a reaction to go forward spontaneously, and clearly these reactions do go forward spontaneously, there has to be a negative Gibbs free energy, negative Gibbs free energy. And Gibbs free energy equals uh, change in enthalpy, which is total energy, minus temperature in degrees Kelvin, times the change in entropy. Be negative to go forward uh, spontaneously. <coughs> now, the theories also place different emphases on the hydrophobic, hydrophilic models, but it's pretty much agreed that this is a very important part of protein folding. Hydrophobic means uh, water avoiding. Hydrophilic means water loving. And the different amino acids have different uh, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, hydrophilic characteristics. Some are much, some are very hydrophobic, some are a little bit hydrophobic, and some are very hydrophilic, and <clears throat> some are just a little bit hydrophilic. But with many of these uh, theories, the research is largely computational and increasingly statistical. The equations are really scary. I mean, you got that sigma thing, and exponents with letters instead of numbers, and minuses. Very scary stuff. Very scary. Various forces and interactions fold and stabilize proteins. A lot of the researchers think that if they can figure out how proteins are stabilized, that's how they fold. I'm not sure that's the case at all, but that's the way some of these computational programs work. And I'm going to discuss some of the possible correspondences. Um, the electric charges implicit in the forces and interactions folding can, we believe, be fine-tuned by immediate divine influx. Which forces are dominant must be related to use. And that's appropriate. The work from the weakest at the top The third from the bottom, the covalent bonds are the strongest, but the peptide bonds, which are an intermediate between the uh, covalent and single bonds, I work to make, the, uh, make up the back protein, so that's quite important. Um, let's start with the van der Waals forces, which Susie tells me is von der Waals. Something close to that. No? Von der Waals? Von der Waals. Von der Waals. Okay, von der Waals interactions. Um, in this case, atoms moving in close proximity generate a brief weak attraction. What happens, the, um, there's a temporary distortion of the electron clouds on the atoms as they move clo closer and farther apart. When they move closer and farther apart, the electron clouds move around as a result. And the, um, this causes transient, this actual distortion electron clouds, 
caused a transient uh, electrical dipole, dipole to charged objects. And the dipoles, uh, as a result of flickering in and out, they flicker in and out in van der Waals reactions, allow them to this to participate in the electrostatic <coughs> interactions in the protein molecule. Um, although this is very weak, there's so many of them that they actually overall have a, uh, a, great, a great effect on the molecule. And almost all the atoms in the interior of the molecule are involved in the, in the von der Waals uh, interactions. Now, I was wondering whether or not these weak, simple interactions might correspond to something we might call bare facts or level of effects only. Does it correspond to the sensual corporeal? Perhaps. Um, if you think about these, you think about a nursery with hundreds of babies, and they're all waving their hands and their arms like this, and their feet and their legs like this. They're searching their limited universe for some basic sensory information that they store in their memory. It's a very, very basic thing. Um, think about the wind blowing the clouds across the sky, and then you think about your, the effect of your breath on an ember in a campfire. And then you think about the breath of divine love and wisdom blowing on these little electron clouds, distorting them just enough to make a difference for creation at this level, one of the levels, possibility. And Gard Perry said, maybe at this level we're talking about the literal sense of the word. This is the sense of the letter at this level. Just a thought. Then we come to next hydrogen bonds, very common in protein. 20, uh, rather, 12 of the 20 amino acids form hydrogen bonds. It's a result of asymmetric electron density between closely aligned atoms. And here's a sort of schematic of hydrogen bonds forming. One side is a donor, one side is an acceptor. Depends on which is more electronegative. And hydrogen bonds. Do these correspond to natural knowledge of our lives? Does this car, do these correspond to scientific? This level may relate to the level of not just effects, but now causes and effects, possibly. We jump up to ionic bonds or salt bridges. This occurs with uh, oppositely charged amino acid side chains in close spatial proximity. And here we see it on the very bottom. We see. Uh, an ammonium carboxylate being formed between the ammonium group and the carboxyl group forming an ionic bond. And these are common. Uh, they're important in stabilizing the protein molecule. I'm not sure how important they are in actually the folding reaction itself. But you can see the other reactions as well. You can see the, hyd the force is a hydrogen bond. We're not going to talk about disulfide bonds, <clears throat> but we are going to talk about the hydrophobic interactions which are, uh, in this case, it looks like an aromatic, arom, aromatic hydrocarbon, which are lipids, basically, fats. Strength and ionic bond. Here we get to the first scary equation. Now, if we go back, oops, sorry. Let's call the ammonium group Q1, and we'll call the carboxyl group, where the oxygen is, or the negative Q2. Q1, Q2. So we'll come down here and we'll say the force is proportional to, or in this case, <clears throat> probably inappropriately equal to, the forces of uh, the, the charges, the charge Q1 times Q2 divided by the distance between them times epsilon. Epsilon is the dielectric constant of the solvent. And the larger the epsilon, the smaller the attraction. And we'll talk more about <laughs> Ian will talk more about the dielectric constant in his talk. Now, salt, we know, in a good sense, corresponds to an affection for truth. Therefore, a salt bridge might correspond to a relationship uh, based on an affection for truth. 
now perhaps we're at the level of cognition, which is not just knowing something, it's knowing more about something at a deeper level. Lastly, not lastly, but we're next to the peptide bonds, which form the backbone of the protein. <coughs> and as I said before, it's a strong bond. It's an intermediate between uh, a covalent and a single bond. And they must be pretty strong, because when Anfinson did his experiments with very strong denaturing agents, <coughs> he did not disrupt these bonds. <coughs> so they, they remained intact. The tight bond that resists rotation, and I'm wondering if it might not correspond to the rational, linking the natural mind to the spiritual mind in search of truth. The covalent bonds are the, by far the strongest bonds in a uh, molecule, and therefore, perhaps it has a relationship to marriage, the bond of good and truth. Now, the hydrophobic interactions are particularly interesting to me because. The hydrophobic hydrocarbon residues, amino acid residues, are, are oil-like or lipid-like. And we know that that corresponds to love with a will. <laughs> and lo and behold, we know that love is interior. And it also has interactions with water as the primary drivers in folding. Quantum physics is key to understanding the quantum physics of water is key to understanding the uh, folding mechanisms, but it's way beyond the scope of this particular talk. But we do know that dielectric constant of the solvent and the interior of the environment is an, is an opportunity for fine tuning, which Ian will talk about more later. New horizons would include, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but long range interactions, something called solitons in the cell as a, something called an electrome, <coughs> where everything in the cell works sort of holistically to get the uh, molecules to fold. So everything in the universe that is in harmony with God's plan relates to goodness and truth. In the next slide, I'm just going to paraphrase that um, the organic forms belonging to the body uh, establishes living working such as occur there. Nor do they know that without such influx and correspondence, not even the smallest parts of the body can have life or be set in motion. Briefly, we'll talk about something called chaperone proteins, which are also known as heat shock or stress proteins. These were really discovered early in my medical career. Um, got to know them in the 80s and they uh, multiply dramatically inside the cell in response to stress, <coughs> such as um, infection, uh, thermal burns, and other things. However, they, normally, they exist normally in the cell, and they have multiple functions, including the fact that they are um, midwives. They actually help the protein fold as soon as it's born. And then, and then they act as nursemaids, keeping the protein from folding abnormally. <clears throat> and they also will transport proteins that no longer have useful lives to something called the lysosome, where it's recycled. One wonders if these might not correspond to celestial angels, spiritual angels, and good spirits, because we know that the celestial angels are around babies when they're first born. And in this case, these chaperone proteins act so much like that. They, they're there with this fragile little newborn protein, and they protect it in the most gentle way. Uh, and they actually do help it to fold in uh, quite remarkable ways. And then they also help, they help them at the end of their lives. Now, behold, I make all things new, because a researcher named Susan Lee Lindquist at MIT discovered that there's an additional role of protein molecules, and that is that they may preserve a totally new protein in the cell for some future use. So that particular protein has no current use, but somehow, somehow, that cell knows, somehow that cell knows that sometime in the future, that protein may be useful. 
may be useful, so it's preserved by a chaperone protein. Um, the end to bring the cause into existence and to enable the effect to exist, the cause likewise must act on the level where the effect belongs by calling on an assistant. And that's what we're calling the chaperone molecules, an assistant. To enable the cause to exist, the end must act on the level where the cause belongs, calling on assistant means to help it. Okay. The whole body is an organ, and its formation is determined by hidden forces by which all things act in the wonderful manner in which they flow. Then finishing up, fine-tuning, end, cause, and effect. And there are transient small fluctuations in the constants of nature which are, are involved in the, the workings of providence. Okay, and I'm going to sort of skip through these. And I'm going to sort of skip through these. These are in your uh, handout, so I don't really need to go through these. But the fine structure constant, which there's another thing that's going to be on the test. I want you to memorize <laughs> this equation and all these constants. They're very important. Uh, extra credit if you get them in the right order. But you'll notice that um, I believe somewhere embedded in there. No, there's mostly just E2. Okay, the charge. But this is what we're talking about, varying these constants. And finally, within the human being, spring from that world, and the pure or more interior things are formed such as are able, such as are able to receive influx. So what we basically have been trying to uh, focus on are the pure and more interior things which are able to receive influx and what that looks like, what they look like. So that's it. And uh, protein folding in a nutshell in half an hour. Okay. Okay. Thank you.